a quick poll. Um, right. So we have uh, one, two, one, two, three. Three proper lectures left um, because next week we only have one lecture because Thanksgiving. And then the final week of class, we have the little test on the Tuesday. And on Thursday, I was thinking about just letting you guys work on your projects because I'm sure that um, not everyone's going to be finished by that point. And usually I think that works well. And I'll, just, I'll be here in class and we can just have like a, you know, an open session where if you want to talk about any like last minute hiccups, then myself and a few of the Chays will be here. But I'm thinking this Thursday we'll just leave open. So that really only leaves three more lectures after this one. And there's five methods I wrote down um, to discuss. Um, the first is conditional gradient, which is a method that's even cheaper in a sense than gradient descent. Or you can think about it like it's going the opposite direction from gradient descent. So not gradient descent to Newton, that was like first or second order method. Conditional gradient is kind of using even less information in a sense. I don't know if that's a fair way of describing it, but it's very cheap. Iterations are cheap and it can be done at large scale. Um, or projected Newton. This is how to do Newton's method with, um, with box constraints, basically. Um, that's, those are two options for that Tuesday. Um, I'll just tell you all the things, and we can vote. Um, fast stochastic methods. This was uh, revisiting stochastic optimization uh, with some of the more recent twists on how to accelerate these methods. Um, and then I had a, a lecture that I could give on non-convex methods. These are really just problem cases that I know how to solve. They're not general prescriptions for how to solve non-convex problems. Rather, they're just a survey of non-convex problems that have um, nice solutions that we can characterize. Or um, something called exact path algorithms. So this is how to solve certain problems that have a hyperparameter like a lasso problem where they have a tuning parameter lambda or an SVM where you have a, something multiplying the, um, the margin, that like constant C, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and to s these, these are, this would be a lecture that discusses algorithms that solve for the entire path. So that means characterize the solution as a function of the, that parameter rather than what we've been doing all semester, which is just pick a parameter. It's, it's a single optimization problem. Solve it. This is sometimes called the Pareto frontier in optimization. So it's getting you the solution as you vary some parameter continuously. All right, so that was five options for three lectures. I think probably the easiest thing to do is I'm going to go through each one and tell me if you don't want to hear about that. If you don't want to hear about that, raise your hand. And then I'll just try to gauge which one had the most dislikes, or the, mo the two had the most dislikes. Conditional gradient. So this was like um, cheap iterations. And OK. You don't have to be offended. I'm not going to mind if you don't want to hear about it. We have to eliminate two. Um, project Indian. OK. Um, fast stochastic methods. Non-convex um, problems. And exact path algorithms. OK, so it seems to me like uh, the losers were projected Newton and exact path algorithms. So um, that seemed pretty clear. I think that's where we're, we're going to go with. If you are dying to hear about one of these things and you somehow just didn't feel like uh, voicing, making your voice heard today, then send me an email. I still might change my mind. but. For now, the plan will be, um, we'll talk about conditional gradient on Tuesday, then fast stochastic stuff and non-convex stuff the last, the last week of class. OK. Um, so I think other than that, unless there's questions, we can just jump into our court and descent lecture. So last time we went, for this, we went through this motivation. So I'll just remind you what it was. Um, we had this property that. Um, if I had a convex differentiable function, and I told you that I was at a point x such that any coordinate moves could not make the function smaller, which means that increasing the ith component by any amount delta or decreasing by any amount delta could not have made the function smaller for any i. Okay, so I can't move along any of the coordinate axes starting from x and make the function smaller. That's what we call a coordinate-wise minimizer. We have the property that if f was 
convex and differentiable, then a quotenwise minimizer implies that you have the overall minimizer. Okay, that just came from the fact that if the if the fu function was convex and differentiable, and I told you that um, it was minimized along every coordinate, then that means all of its partial derivatives should be zero because treating the function as a function of one variable, it should be minimized at that particular x, right? So each of these is going to be zero, which means the gradient itself is zero overall, and that's we know that's necessary and sufficient for a smooth convex function to be minimized. Okay, we saw though that when f was convex but non-differentiable these two things were not the same. So we had an example of a coordinate-wise minimum in this picture that was not an overall minimum. It was just any one of the non-differentiability points here on this, on this contour. Okay, so it corresponded to lying somewhere on the hull of this boat. If I move in either the x1 or x2 direction, the function only gets bigger. Okay, because I only visit contours that are farther and farther away from the minimum. But, I, but I'm not at the minimum itself, which is uh, here at 0, 0. Okay, this is actually the picture that's on the course website, by the way. That was the motivation for that picture. So um, the last question that we looked at for motivation was this one. If I had a function which was a smooth and convex function, g plus a separable function, and the separable function is convex but not necessarily differentiable, okay, so g of x plus the sum of hi of xi, then we are, again, in a situation where a coordinate-wise minimizer implies that we have an overall minimizer. Okay, we actually proved that last time. <clears throat> this came from a simple argument um, using the first order characterization for convexity of G. So we lower bound the difference between f of y and f of x using, um, this was G, G of y minus G of x, and this was you know, the sum of hi of yi minus sum of hi of xi. We bound, lower bound this term by its um, tangent line, essentially. And then we just combined these two terms uh, so that we had a sum over all i, and we observed that actually being a coordinate-wise minimizer for this function at every coordinate implied that each one of these terms was non-negative. Okay, that just came from a, a simple calculation using subgradients. Okay, roughly the idea was that at a high level, by looking at separable functions that are non-smooth, all of the non-differentiabilities, all the, the points that, at which maybe the function is not differentiable, they're going to be aligned with the coordinate axes. So for doing an exact coordinate-wise minimization, then we're not going to get stuck anywhere. Okay, so it basically took this picture and it rotated it so that the um, non-differentiabilities lay aligned with the coordinate axes. Okay, so here's coordinate descent. We didn't um, show this slide last time, but here is the method. You give me a function that's smooth plus separable. So g plus the sum of hi, where each hi is only a function of a single component, xi. Um, g being smooth, and both, both being convex. Then we start with some initial guess, call it x0, and we repeatedly just minimize over one coordinate at a time. So let's suppose we start with the first com coordinate. I first consider this function, this function f, which is a function, say, of n variables, x1 through xn just as a, as a function of x1. And I fix x2 through xn at their current values. So starting off at, at step k equals 1, these are all just at their initial values. x2, 0, all the way through xn, 0. And I minimize out over x1 exactly. Okay, I'm assuming I can do that exactly in, with, with corn descent. Okay, and I get, the, I get the argument minimizer. Then I move on to looking at the function only as a uh, restricted function of x2. With all, with all their variables fixed. And I, I again fix x3 through xn at their previous values. But I actually update x1 to be its new value. Okay, so I just solved for x1 in the previous step. I use that value of x1, not, not the one that, that had happened before this cycle. So for example, if I'm running this at step k equals 1, then this was the, the solution from that coordinate-wise minimization over the variable 1. So this would be x1, 1. But these would all be x3, 0 through xn, 0. These are just the initial values because we haven't updated them yet. OK, and I continue. I solve for x2. I plug in now the most recent values of x1 and x2 into my function. I minimize out over x3 with x4 through n fixed at their old values, et cetera. OK, once I get to xn, I repeat. I just go back and solve for x1 again. Sometimes called cyclic, cyclic coordinate descent to 
emphasize this cyclic nature. I'm just cycling through the components one through and over and over again. Okay, so an important note, to say it one more time, after we solve for xi, we have to use its new value for the minimization that involves xi plus 1, not its old value. So um, some notes. Paul Sang, who is a, um, who is a very important figure in optimization, who passed away recently. He's done a lot of work on coordinate descent. Um, and he's had some of the seminal papers on this method. And in 2001, he has a paper that proves that for any such function, so smooth plus separable, um, if that coordinate descent uh, algorithm has a limit point, so if it's going to converge to something, then that something is going to be a minimizer of, our, of my function f. OK, and um, because we're always decreasing the function's criterion value at every step, we're always decreasing the criterion value at every step. That's clear just from the nature of this method, right? We're only ever making the criterion smaller. Um, if the if the function, if the sublevel set, say the set of all x for which f of x was less than or equal to my initial value, if that was compact and we we're always decreasing the criterion at every point, then some basic real analysis would tell us that um, even if there's not necessarily a convergence point of coordinate descent, there's going to be a subsequence that converges. So as you run the algorithm, you're going to see that there actually maybe is a subsequence that's converging. That's just a basic real analysis fact that every bounded sequence has a convergent subsequence. So that's going to converge to a minimizer. Okay, so these are fairly, um, these results don't assume really much at all about the function other than smooth plus separable. So a few notes. Um, the order of the cycle through coordinates is arbitrary. So we could use any permutation of 1 through n. And in fact, Sang proves that as long as you um, have an order in which you visit the coordinates, some, some prescription um, over which to visit the coordinates such that every coordinate gets updated, um, say, within less than or equal to some constant times n iterations. So for example, as long as I, I touch every coordinate every 3n iterations, not even every iteration, so it's not quite a permutation, but um, I'm allowed to visit more, you know, some coordinates more frequently than others, then I get the same, basically the same results. So you can permute the order of the coordinates at every step. That would be fine. That would be like a randomized cyclic coordinate descent. Um, that would still have the same properties. Everywhere we can replace individual coordinates by blocks of coordinates. And this one's actually very important. So here I actually wrote hi of xi with the idea in mind that xi is a single component of x, but actually it could be a block of variables as well. As long as hi of xi is convex, um, if xi is a block of variables and, I'm, and I perform this minimization over an entire block, say like a pair or a triplet of variables, then the same algorithm applies, the same properties that we discussed hold. These could even be different blocks of different sizes and any way to carve up the function into different blocks. As long as um, right, my, my, my non-smooth part separates into functions of blocks of variables. So this is another very important point. Um, these one at a time updates are critical. So the fact that we had to take um, the most recent value of xi after solving in the next step, in the optimization for xi plus 1, and we didn't use the old value, that's pretty critical. Um, the alternative is you might call an all at once scheme, where we just update x1, but we forget about the fact that we updated it, and we move on to the next step. And I put an xi, x1 um, from iteration k minus 1 here. Okay, So I, I make a pass, but I never actually update the variables um, after they've been minimized, after I, I found the, the minimizers. And I only do that at the end of the cycle. That would, you might call it an all at once scheme. Why might you prefer that? It's because if that were the scheme you were taking, then this could be done in parallel. Right? I could just send off a bunch of processors to do each of these coordinate-wise minimizations in parallel. It may, may be a lot more efficient. Unfortunately, that's not known to converge in general. And in fact, you can come up with simple examples where that just fails drastically. So um, this is the, a very strong analogy to the difference between Ga Gauss-Seidel and Jacobi methods for solving linear systems. So we have maybe only just one slide on this when we talked about numerical linear algebra. But um, 
Gauss-Seidel and the Jacobi method are two different ways of doing a component-wise, um, uh, they're component-wise iterations for solving linear systems. They are exactly coordinate ascent applied to a particular loss function for a linear system. And Gauss-Seidel is, is exactly the coordinate ascent method we learned here. And Jacobi is the um, all-at-once version, the version that just um, tries to minimize out over every coordinate with, not, with the idea in mind that it's not going to be making these sequential updates, and then updates the components at the end of a cycle. OK, and it's the same idea. Gauss-Seidel is known to converge in general. Jacobi is not for solving linear systems. Okay. Any questions about court and ascent before we kind of dive in deeper? OK, so let's go through an example. Um, Let's just do a very simple case of linear regression. OK, and this, this is going to look a lot like um, I'm actually not sure if this is exactly the Gauss-Seidel method. It, it may be. Or there may be just a slight difference in the way we actually parameterize the lost function. Um, but nonetheless, this is a coordinate descent algorithm applied to um, linear regression. So let's suppose we want to solve um, the linear system uh, x transpose x beta equals x transpose y. Or in other words, we want to minimize um, the least squares loss between y and x beta. Okay, So very simple problem. Um, of course, we know this has an exact solution. right? But we could think about approaching it from the perspective of coordinate ascent. It's going to be helpful um, just from seeing how the kind of how coordinate ascent would work in this case, and also as we talk about more advanced problems in the next few slides. So what I do is I just think about looking at this criterion and um, thinking of all beta j's as being fixed except for one beta i, and, and thinking about if I can exactly minimize out over beta i with all beta j's fixed. So we can write out the criterion as follows. Um, I can think about taking a linear combination of all of the columns where j is not equal to i, and just leaving out um, the i, that should say beta i, sorry. And I'm going to think about this subproblem, minimize out over only beta i. So all the beta j's for j not equal to i are fixed. And in the slides, I've written this as y minus x minus i, beta minus i. So this is just to indicate that I'm, this is like taking the all columns of x that are not column i and multiplying it by all components of beta that are not component i. That's what this is precisely right here. OK, you can also think about this as the residual. This is the residual from um, regressing y onto all variables except for xi, this term right here. OK, so um, if I take a. Um, a gradient of this with respect to beta i, or really a derivative, because it's just a one-dimensional optimization problem right now, right? then I, I get um, that xi transpose um, y minus x minus i beta minus i plus xi beta i, and I want to set that equal to 0 right? in order to exactly minimize that over beta i, because this is a smooth and convex function. This is a function of beta i. And um, from that, I can see that just simply beta i is going to be x i transpose y minus x minus i beta minus i divided by x i transpose x i. Okay, So that's my update for variable i. Now, if I were to repeat this over and over again, so I would start at beta 1, I would initialize beta, say, all at zeros, and just compute beta 1 to just be the, this is just doing a univariate regression of y on uh, xi, uh, x1, for example. And then I take that value, and I plug it in, and I, I um, optimize out over beta 2. So now this is just going to be x1 beta 1. And I repeat, and I do a univariate regression of this residual on x2, and so on and so forth. If I repeat that over and over again, which is just doing court descent, 
that I'm going to converge according to Paul to to Sang's theorem to um, the linear regression coefficients, the solution to this original problem. Okay, but we could also do this in any order we wanted. We didn't have to just cycle through the components in that order. So that's coordinate descent for linear regression. Let's um, let's compare uh, one cycle of coordinate descent. So we're going to compare one full cycle. So that this updates over i going from 1 through p, if I have p variables, to one iteration of gradient descent. One iteration of gradient descent actually updates the entire beta vector as well, right? My whole optimization parameter. And one cycle is going to update all components of this parameter vector as well. Okay? The gradient descent updates, um, right, of course they're just they're just going to be beta plus gets um, beta minus t times the gradient. Um, and the, that I can just write as plus t times x transpose y minus x beta for some step size t. Okay, So we're going to compare these two, a full cycle of this, i going from 1 to p, to this thing. And that's what I've done on this plot here. And I have gradient descent in red and coordinate descent in blue applied to the same problem. And I ran it over something like 100 problem instances, where n was 100 and p was 20. So I was just solving a linear regression with 20 variables and 100 observations. And I, I have all of the, the various convergence curves um, in light blue or light red for coordinate descent and gradient descent. And then I've taken the average as a dark blue and a dark red line, just to show you the difference. And it's pretty striking, right? Every single run of coordinate ascent completely dominated gradient ascent. So there are, every single blue line here was, is converging a lot faster than every red line. And there's a very big difference in the average convergence behaviors. So um, by 20 iterations, coordinate ascent already has accuracy at around 10 to the minus 10. Um, but even by 40 iterations, gradient ascent is looking at like 10 to the minus 6, maybe, or 10 to the minus 7. So very different. This is a log scale. So very different um, convergence regimes. Okay. So just one second. I'll take that question just a second. I wanted just to stress now that this is very different from acceleration as well. Okay. So you might say, well, I can do I can do accelerated gradient descent. I know I can make gradient descent faster. We can use Nesterov acceleration. The plots we were looking at showed that actually that did a lot better than gradient descent. So here I put that in green. And if we were only comparing green to red, that would be a pretty big difference, because then the log scale axis would show that they're actually quite different. Okay, we may even be getting like a somewhat something close to a, a factor of 10 or 5 here or something in terms of how fast it's converging. But still, this is nowhere close to what coordinate ascent is doing. So coordinate ascent is much, much faster than gradient ascent or accelerated gradient ascent for this simple problem. And of course, just to repeat, this is a problem in which we know the exact solution. It's just uh, a quadratic. But I'm, I'm demonstrating um, coordinate descent here so that we can kind of understand its behavior. OK, and, and it's important to remember that this is much, uh, uses much more information than our first order method, okay, because we're actually exactly optimizing out over every coordinate. It's using much more information than the gradient. So this does not violate our um, optimality principle for Nesterov's um, accelerated gradient descent. We saw that among first order methods, Nesterov's acceleration does the best possible theoretically. So how can coordinate descent blow it out of the water here? It's because it's not a first order method. Okay, we're doing a lot more than just looking at the gradient. Kevin. Good question. Um, so the, as we've learned, it doesn't require a step size, which is a huge advantage to coordinate descent. That's because we're performing uh, exact component-wise minimizations. So we'll, we'll talk at the, at the end about a, an unfortunate misnomer, which is 
Another version of coordinate descent that doesn't do this, that uses a step size, um, it's also called coordinate descent. But um, it's because we're performing exact component-wise minimizations. We don't require any kind of step size. It's a huge advantage. Yeah. Yeah, good question. We'll also get to that, but um, it's a lot more specialized in application than, say, gradient descent, because we have to know how to be able to do these minimizations in closed form. And they have to be fairly efficient. But it comes up more often than you might think. Yeah? Uh, if our problem isn't strongly convex, we observe the same thing? Um, yeah, I, I don't think the convergence of coordinate descent has much to do, in this case, with strong convexity. But uh, as we're going to discuss later, the theory for coordinate descent is kind of all in shambles. So these are all just guesses. I don't really have a good answer for that. There's a lot of, there's a lot of theory being worked out right now for coordinate descent, but it's not, the picture is not as clear as it is for first order methods. How does this method compare to directly solving the gradient? Directly solving the gradient? Yes. Well, I'm sorry, what do you mean by that? Oh, you mean solving the problem analytically? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so this is a question of whether or not this iterative method is good for solving this linear system versus what else. So, right, we'd have to perform some other thing to solve that linear system, like a QR decomposition of Cholesky. We 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 had a lecture on how to solve linear systems, and um, this is an iterative method for solving linear system. It's not a direct method. So, the answer I would give is it just depends on your problem size. Roughly speaking, the rule of thumb that we gave was that if the problem you're trying to solve, the linear system you're trying to solve, can fit in memory, then maybe you want to do something like a direct method, QR or Cholesky. If the problem is big enough that it doesn't fit in memory, then that's where iterative methods really shine. Okay, so this doesn't require that all the data is in memory, and the iterations are very cheap. Right, here we're just performing inner products um, of one variable with another. That actually comes to my next point, which I thought someone was going to raise. Um, you might object that actually a full cycle of coordinate descent should not be compared to a, a um, one iteration of gradient descent because you may think that actually this has a, a full cycle here. If I go from i going from 1 through p, you might think that actually this costs a lot more than a single gradient update. Let's just do a very quick calculation here. Um, how expensive is... Um, Right, how expensive is um, one gradient descent cycle? So here I'm multiplying a, um, so first of all, I have to compute the fitted value. And I have to actually compute the inner product between x transpose and my residual. So those both together require order np flops. Because I'm just doing a matrix multiplication of, a, say, this one, the inner product of, or the, the matrix product of x transpose with the residual. I'm doing a, um, this is multiplying a, uh, a p by n matrix by an n by 1 vector. That's order n p flops. Here, okay, you might say that actually in every iteration, in every single iteration within a cycle, I have to multiply x minus i by beta minus i. That's an uh, n by p minus 1 matrix by a p minus 1 by 1 vector. That, al that al already costs order np flops. Okay, And if I'm doing p of them, because it's a full cycle, it's going to be order np squared. So you may say, this actually looks a lot more expensive than um, a single update to gradient descent. Well, that's the case if this is done naively. We're just, we just multiply that matrix x minus i by beta, beta minus i. Okay, the trick to making coordinate descent efficient is actually to do s smarter updates, to use the fact that um, there's a lot of information that's shared across individual iterations within a cycle. So let's rewrite the coordinate descent update just to make that more transparent. I'm going to write this as um, x i transpose um, y minus x beta plus 
uh, xi beta i. OK, I'm just going to, yeah, here I've subtracted off xi beta i, and here I'm adding it back. And uh, we can think of this as the old value, actually. OK, so you can put pluses here if you want to note this is a new value. This can denote the old value. Here I've added xi beta i for the old value of beta i, and I've subtracted I'm adding it back. And let me write this, this thing as r. This is the residual on the full beta vector. So this just ends up being xi transpose r over xi transpose xi plus what's this is xi transpose xi beta i divided by xi transpose xi, so it's just beta i. So now that we see that actually the coordinate set update is nothing more than taking the old value of beta i and adding xi transpose the residual over xi transpose xi. So I claim that actually um, this can be done and actually only order n flops. And when I do p of them, I get it back exactly one cycle being order np, which is the same as gradient descent. Now, if that's the case, then the comparison is really fair. So why does this only require order n flops? Because we're going to actually do two things. The first is we're going to think about updating the residual. So we're going to say that we store the residual to be something at the previous iteration. We're going to try to update it so that it's equal to the proper value here, which is y minus x beta for all the current values of beta before I make the update. And then we're going to perform the multiplication inner product between two vectors, xi transpose r. So clearly, this one's going to cost order n flops. OK, so I'm just multiplying. I'm taking inner product between two vectors of length n. This one I, cla I claim also cost order n. Why is that? It's because before I had you know, r being y minus x beta. Okay, and suppose I updated, suppose I'm sitting at step 5. And I just updated variable 5. And I want to move on to step 6. And I'm asking, how do I update the residual? All I've changed between those two is variable 5. Right? That's all that, that, that the only difference between steps 5 and 6 is that variable 5 was updated. So all I do is I actually subtract off the old value of x5 beta 5. And I add on the new value of x5 beta 5. And I have the updated residual. So that just required me adding two vectors of length n, which is still order n. Okay, so updating the residual still only costs order n flops. So it's these kind of tricks that make coordinate descent super efficient and um, that give us speed ups like this. Okay, making, sense, making sure that we pay attention to the fact that from iteration to iteration, a lot of information is shared. So we don't just want to perform naive matrix vector products like this one. We want to think about what we can do from the previous iteration to carry as much computation forward as possible. OK. So let's talk about a, a much less trivial problem, which is the lasso. So now that we, we don't have an explicit solution for, like we did with um, just linear regression, least squares, um, why can we apply core descent to this problem, first of all? It's because that's smooth, the least squares loss. And the second part is separable, which is exactly the condition we needed. This is the sum of the absolute values of beta i, i going from 1 through p. Each of these is a convex function. It's not differentiable, but it separates across components of beta. OK, so this is my hi, just the absolute value function. OK, um, basically we do the same thing as we did in the previous slide. We just think about minimizing over all beta i, over beta i with all beta j fixed. This term, the least squares loss term. I've just separated out beta i for clarity. Plus, what do I have to put here? I only have to actually worry about one term, which is the absolute value of beta i. There are a bunch of other terms that depend on the sum of beta, absolute value of beta j. But they don't affect this minimization at all. Okay, so what is this? This is actually a quadratic 
and beta i. It's univariate. Plus lambda times the absolute value of beta i. It's a very simple problem. Okay, and you would not be surprised at all if I told you the solution, or you should not be surprised if I told you the solution was soft thresholding. Because we basically, this is just the proc, this is one component of the prox operator. Okay? So the solution is, and there's a little more details on the slide, but for example, we could take a subgrading here, set it equal to zero. The, the smooth part would just be this, right? It would be this gradient part from our calculation before. And then we just get plus lambda times the subgrading of, of the absolute value of beta i. Set that equal to zero. You can again see it's soft thresholding. The solution is just this guy. Um, soft threshold, now at the level lambda over xi transpose xi. OK, just because here we had a term that looked like xi transpose xi beta i in this quadratic. So it's a univariate quadratic, but it didn't have um, a 1 multiplying the term beta i squared like we usually do in the prox operator. So to get that, I can divide through everywhere by xi transpose xi. And that's just why this lambda gets affected accordingly. And I'm going to just basically soft threshold um, the update that I would have gotten had I not had the L1 norm. So just a univariate regression of the residual on variable xi. So that's the solution. Okay, so very um, simple subproblem. I can write down, you can think about it multiple ways, um, but you can derive this exactly from the perspective of either the subgradients or just rem remembering that this is like a, the prox operator we learned already. Okay, so I just repeat this over and over again, right? One cycle. Goes through i equals one through p. Okay. Again, we can make this very efficient. Um, I guess I didn't have a, a plot of how this compares to proximal gradient, but this crushes proximal gradient in the same way that the coordinate descent for linear regression beats gradient descent. Okay. It's much more efficient than even accelerated proximal gradient for this problem. And again, we can compare each. We can compare one cycle here to one. Uh, proximal gradient update, there's no problem with that because of this trick. So we think about soft thresholding this quantity actually, right? I can write this as actually, if I want, the soft threshold holded version of xi transpose r over xi transpose xi plus beta i. It's another way of writing it. I just remember that in order to do this efficiently, I should first keep track of r at every iteration, and then just update it when I get to iteration i. That makes this whole update order n, and then the soft thresholding is, is just going to be um, it's an order 1 computation here. right? Just check whether it's bigger than this in absolute value. Questions about that? So different algorithm for the lasso problem compared to the ones we've seen so far, which have mostly then proximal gradient, and then, um, although we didn't maybe explicitly say this, you could also use an interior point method for this problem, right, by just reparameterizing this, introducing a slack variable. That was something that we kind of done with generalized lasso problems, or the group, sorry, the fused lasso problems, which you could also have done here. This is a different, different approach. So we'll come back to core descent for the lasso in just a bit. I, I'll say more about um, some implementation tricks that people tend to use in practice, but. That is the basic method. Just repeat that over and over again. OK. Um, maybe for the sake of time, I won't go through this one, because it's similar to the last one. But you can do something similar with box-constrained regression. OK, why, why can I think of box-constrained regression as a problem that I'm allowed to solve with court descent? Maybe that's the only bit we'll go through. You can think about the box-constrained regression problem as follows. So instead of having a, um, an infinity norm constraint on beta, as I do in the slides, which says that beta must be um, less than or equal to s in absolute value for all of its components, I can think about that as actually adding p 
indicator functions, one for each component of beta, which says that the absolute value of beta i must be less than or equal to s. Okay, this together is the same as having the constraint. Right, this is equivalent to a constraint that I say subject to absolute value of beta i less than or equal to s for all i, which is in turn equivalent to just the infinity norm constraint. Like that, because that, the infinity norm is just the maximum of all these guys. So I can think about this box constraint, this infinity norm constraint, as really a sum of indicator functions. Each one of these indicator functions is only a function of one variable. And therefore, this guy is my hi. It is convex, because it's the indicator function of a convex set, but it's certainly not smooth. It's not even continuous, right? It goes up to infinity as soon as beta i exceeds s an absolute value. OK, so this problem I can solve with coordinate descent because of this logic. Um, and now I can just think about minimizing a quadratic for the subproblems subject to my one variable beta i, because I'm thinking about just doing the minimization over beta i with all their beta j's fixed, lying in an interval between minus s and s. Right? If I think about fixing all the other variables, the only constraint I have on beta i is it should lie between minus s and s. So that's just doing a quadratic minimization, a univariate quadratic minimization over an interval. And the solution is pretty intuitive. Just take the, the overall minimizer, if I didn't have the interval constraint. So they take the minimizer of the quadratic. If it happens to lie in the interval, then you're done. If it's to the right of s, then the smallest that can be over the interval is s. If it's to the left, left of s, then the smallest it can be over the interval is minus s. Right? That's just this picture. I told you that you, I wanted you to minimize this quadratic subject to you know, a constraint like this that I have to lie within minus s and s. And there are three cases. The first, that the minimizer already lies in that interval. The second case is that it, the minimizer, say, lies to the right of the interval minus s, s. Okay? In which case, you just take the constraint minimizer to be this. And the third case is just that it lies to the left. Um, this guy, right? So the constraint minimizer you just take to be minus s. Okay, so pretty simple updates. And it's, it's really just the, um, it's kind of like the complement operator to soft thresholding. Okay, so that's how we can use coordinate descent to perform box constraint regression. Okay, um, so we went through three examples and three kind of successful applications of coordinate descent. Um, I put a few more in the slides. I don't think we have time to go through all of them. I'll just quickly mention them and give you some references in case you're curious. Um, one of the very first algorithms for SVMs was uh, a, a flavor of coordinate descent where it actually minimized over pairs of coordinates. So it was a block coordinate descent method where the blocks were of size 2. That's um, called sequential minim minimal optimization. And it differs from coordinate descent in a few ways. One of the ways in which it's different is that it's greedy. So it doesn't actually choose to update the co coordinates in some cyclic order, or even some randomized cyclic order. It greedily se selects the next set block of coordinates to update, always in pairs, um, according to some criterion. Okay, so it, it's a little bit different in that sense. And it's also not the case that um, we have the separability assumptions that we need because of constraints like this. So here I'm looking at the SVM dual. Um, because of a constraint like this, which ties all of the components of my dual variable alpha together, I don't really have a separable problem. Um, but uh, there is some kind of early SVM theory or SVM optimization theory that shows that this kind of thing converges under some conditions. It's just different from the kind of typical optimization uh, literature that so much of that was developed by saying, as I said, um, but it really is a block to coordinate descent method. Okay, and and um, recently there have been many kind of uh, attempts to revisit 
quarter cent or block quarter cent for SVM. And there's a nice um, contribution in this paper here by Shea et al. And you can look at the, the list of references at the end. Okay, so that was as applied to um, support vector machines. And later in the lecture, if we get to it, I, I can discuss an application of something called the graphical lasso. Okay, so let me give you a bit of um, history of coordinate descent and statistics and machine learning, and then a bit of high level stuff and tips, and uh, then we'll take a break and talk a bit more about the converge what's known about the convergence theory for coordinate descent. So, um, as far as I can tell, this Id idea within statistics is an old idea in optimization. Um, but in, in terms of the statistics and machine learning literature, the first time people decided to use it or to really um, pay attention to the idea appeared in a master's thesis by uh, Wen Zhang Fu. Or may, this may have been a PhD thesis, I forget, in 1998, where he exactly proposed coordinate descent for the lasso. So it was exactly this algorithm proposed. It was called the shooting method. He decided to call it the shooting method rather than coordinate descent. Um, and it ap appeared again in this paper by Ingrid de Bonchies and some of her co-authors. This is a very, she's a very well-known researcher on wavelets from the applied math literature, signal processing community. But inexplicably, this was just completely ignored. Nobody paid attention to this at all. People didn't really think anything of this algorithm that's proposed in 1998. I don't know why. Um, it, was, it was ignored. And then there are three papers in about 2007, which all came out around the same time which all proposed coordinate ascent for lasso, basically the lasso, or problems of the lasso flavor. And that sparked a huge interest in statistics and machine learning. And the optimization community, probably rightly so, looked at um, statisticians and machine learning researchers with a bit of skepticism because this was a very old idea in optimization that people had known about for a very long time. And it was never regarded with, um, as a very you know, efficient or interesting method. It was regarded as a very simple method that only applied in some cases. But I think um, there's a good reason why people in stats and machine learning have become so interested. It's because there's a lot of um, neat tricks you can do, like this residual updating trick that we discussed. And there's a lot of new things to be said now about coordinate ascent um, in terms of its convergence theory. And that's coming out right now. So I think you know, the statistics and machine learning researchers have kind of had a ha-ha moment where the optimization community is now paying attention to coordinate ascent again, in large part because of um, all the work that was done in those communities in implementing coordinate descent. So why is it used? Why is it now gaining so much popularity? It's because it's very simple and easy to implement. Um, typically, you only choose to implement it over problems where this is true. And uh, as we mentioned earlier, there is no kind of optimization tuning parameter you have to fit, like a backtracking parameter, uh, like, a, like a step size parameter that you use backtracking to determine at every step, or a barrier parameter and interior point methods. These kind of things just don't exist for the coordinate descent um, methods that we've discussed because you're performing these exact component-wise minimizations. Careful implementations of coordinate descent can be near state of the art. And I think that comes from two things. The first is that um, they share a lot of information from iteration to iteration based on their nature. And the second thing is that they tend not to be very memory intensive. So you don't have to actually ha perform full operations on the full data set if it's, if it's set up properly. Um, these can be done in a with very low uh, memory usage. And that can be very important for large scale problems. Um, so some examples of coordinate ascent successful applications are the lasso we just saw, um, doing uh, generalized linear models with L1 penalties. You, we do something called proximal Newton. We learned that already to turn the generalized linear model loss into a least squares loss. Once you have it under a least squares loss, you just run your favorite coordinate ascent algorithm on it. Um, SVMs, there are multiple ways to do coordinate descent with SVMs. The group lasso, the graphical lasso, which we may talk about at the end. Additive models really use something called backfitting, which is a block form of coordinate descent. Matrix completion, even regression with non-convex penalties, people have kind of seriously investigated with coordinate descent. Okay, so it's, it's applicable to a wide range of problems, but not every problem, because we have to be able to perform these exact um, coordinate-wise minimizations. Okay, so we typically only apply it in situations where that's simple, but if we're in such a situation, then it can be very efficient. So let me discuss um, some stuff that's built on top of coordinate ascent that um, is built on top of tricks like this residual updating trick 
that make um, coordinate descent just so efficient for problems like the lasso, or problems where sparsity um, is induced in the solution. Okay, so I'm, I'm talking about some of the um, strategies that are outlined from these papers, but now they're really commonplace, I think, in most, impl most implementations of coordinate descent, use something like this. So there, there's kind of two ideas. The first is um, uh, a path-wise strategy, and the second is an active set strategy. And the first one is something we've seen before, but it's particularly helpful for coordinate descent. Um, the idea is that if you want to solve the lasso problem, and we had a parameter like this lambda, okay, and the user, the statistician or the data analysis, whatever, didn't have a value of lambda in mind, but just wanted to compute the solution over a range of lambda values, because they, he, didn't, he or she didn't know the level of sparsity desired, then we would start with a very large value of lambda, compute the solution with coordinate ascent, and then use the, the final um, estimate, the one that we converged on, to warm start our problem at a slightly smaller value of lambda, um, perform coordinate ascent, use, again, use the solution to warm start our algorithm for a slightly smaller value of lambda and so forth, um, and finish at some reasonably small value of lambda. Okay, typically, in practice, these, these are log-spaced. There's no theory for that. That's just what people have found works well. Um, this is so efficient, and I'll explain why in a second, that oftentimes, if you want to compute the solution at just a single value of lambda, it's more efficient to, to compute the solution at, say, 50 values of lambda um, before that and ending at the current value of lambda um, because of the information that you can feed from, from one problem to the next. Okay, so let me just say that again. Suppose that you want to solve the problem at lambda equals 10. Okay, but that was, that was a fairly dense solution in the sense that a good number of the components of beta would be non-zero at that value of lambda. What many implementations will do is, even if you want the solution at just one value of lambda, it'll start solving the problem for much values of, larger values of lambda that you didn't care about, like lambda equals 1,000, and it'll work its way down to lambda equals 10 after something like 25 to 50 um, problems it's solved. And then it'll solve the problem that you wanted at lambda equals 10 using warm starts to get there. And it'll just give you that back. It might not even tell you that it's doing that. So why is that so efficient with coordinate ascent? It's because of something called the active set strategy. So these two things are important together. Um, the idea is, because we're seeking a sparse solution, we perform a small number of coordinate cycles, maybe something like five maximum, to determine which components we think are going to be zero at the solution. So we cycle through these updates, where we just we are performing soft thresholds over um, univariate regressions. And after five or so passes, five, five cycles through the full coordinate list, we get that a bunch of coordinates are, have been soft thresholded to zero. Okay, and we're going to guess that at the solution, those things are going to remain zero. Now what we do is we actually ignore all of those coordinates. So suppose I'm trying to solve a problem with 1,000 variables. So I, I'm trying to solve a, a lasso over 1,000 variables. I do five passes of coordinate ascent, and 900 of them, um, 900 of, of, my, of my components of beta have been soft threshold to zero after five passes. I ignore those 900 from now on. I only look at the other 100, which were non-zero after those five passes. And I just perform a coordinate ascent loop over that small number. So I just iterate over that small number, 100, because all the other variables are going to stay 0. They won't contribute to those updates until conversions. Once I converge on that 100, then I go through a full loop of my entire um, variables with one final cycle of coordinate ascent. If nothing changed, if the variables that were 0 remain 0, then I'm done. I have the solution. If I found that actually a variable that was deemed 0 initially became non-zero in that final loop, then I just include it to the active set, and I repeat. I iterate in the small active set until conversions. So that's called the active set strategy. And it can be extremely efficient if you're trying to solve for a sparse solution. So if the final solution had five components over 1,000 being equal to 0, and your active set through these uh, inner iterations had only size, say, 10, then you've basically reduced the problem from a 1,000-dimensional problem to a 10-dimensional problem. And so it's much, much more efficient. That's why it's so efficient for solving the, that's why it's so efficient to use coordinate descent when we want to solve the problem at large values of lambda, because there are so many components of the solution that are zero. Okay, so our active set here is going to be very small. So anyway, in other words, this is done very quickly because the active set is so small, so we converge very, very fast. 
lambda 2 is slightly harder, but by warm starting will do better, and so on. And by the time we get to a, a value of lambda where the solution is fairly dense, the hope is that we've um, warm started ourselves in a good enough spot that coordinate descent still converges quickly. Okay, so that, that's the flavor of um, pathwise coordinate descent for problems like the last one, but this really holds for any problem. People use the strategy for any problem in which sparsity is being induced by a penalty. And, uh, and you can maybe start to see now why coordinate descent can be competitive with state of the art given kind of um, the implementation tricks like this, like these ones. Any questions about, about that? Okay, let's take a break. Um, when we come back, we'll do a bit of theory.